Welcome to Legislative Updates. I'm your host, Doug Thompson, and as always, with my special guest, John Barker, a representative from the 70th District, covering Dickinson County, and as I oftentimes say, most of the free world here. <laughs> but we've also brought in uh, Senator Rick Wilborn from uh, McPherson. And thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you for the invitation, and, and thank you, Judge Barker, for inviting me. Yeah, he's always good about bringing uh, top-notch guests coming in each time, uh, almost every time. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> uh, what I mean by that is sometimes we don't have a special guest. They're always top-notch guests. They're all top-notch. <laughs> 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 Listen, you're a top-notch guest, so we're glad to have you. <laughs> John, what's happened since the, since the last show? Since the last show, of course, uh, Wednesday, the 29th of May, uh, the House went in at 10, and we started uh, what is normally a, a ceremonial date. Uh, it's called signy die, end of the session. Uh, but this was probably the busiest signy die that, uh, that's been around for in history, maybe. We had a number of issues to take up. Uh, first issue we took up is we had a House concurrent resolution uh, because the governor back on the uh, 9th of May, because of all the flooding, uh, declared uh, an emergency, uh, a state of uh, uh, disaster emergency declaration, but it's only good for 10 days. Now she can go back to the Finance Council, which she chairs, and extend that for 30 days. But since the 9th of May, we've had more flooding in involving more counties, particularly uh, Dickinson County, and so we, we prepared a resolution to extend it out till January of next year, and we've added in several counties, and I got Dickinson County included in that, because we, as you know, Doug, we've had some flooding uh, down on the river and also over in Chapman and preparing, and we're still in that stage where it could be, it, it could get worse uh, based on the, uh, the amount of rainfall, so uh, we took that up very first uh, item on our, on our agenda that day and passed it. Uh, unanimously, um, and, and that will allow us to access some federal funds. And, uh, and if it may get it may get worse, and if it gets worse, we can add additional counties uh, uh, as the governor would deem appropriate. But if you hadn't applied, then you wouldn't be up it to would consideration be at a later yeah, time. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, you know that this was an important issue. We need to take it up. We took it up. We passed it unanimously. Uh, sent it to the Senate. Senate did the same. Uh, and then we went into the veto session, uh, and we had uh, 2033, a, a House bill, which had to do with the tax cuts that the governor had vetoed. Uh, we debated that for probably an hour, uh, and then we voted. It, it failed. The veto <coughs> failed. We had uh, 79 votes. You need 84, uh, which, from my mind, uh, was very disappointing. Uh, I think it would have passed the Senate had we got it over to the Senate, uh, but uh, it did fail. But uh, you know, we were waiting then for the Senate to take up some veto overrides on Senate bills because they must take them up first. The Senate bills, we t the House takes the House bills up first, and so Rick can probably talk a little bit about what happened over there with your uh, Senate bill as to the uh, the uh, the veto. Right. We, we did, uh, ours was, we took up first, of course, the tax cut, and they took it the, where the governor vetoed four, I believe, four issues on the appropriations bill. And Rick? Well, uh, those four issues uh, were bundled together, uh, as opposed, there was some debate as to should we take them single file. Uh, but the House had uh, predetermined uh, they liked the four issue bundle and quite a bit of debate on each one of the issues all the way from capers, uh, the mental health issue, uh, school uh, help with the certificates of uh, young uh, technical uh, students. And at the end of the day, it passed uh, 27 to 11. All four so then? All four in a bundle. Okay. Right. And then we, of course, then it uh, went over to the House. And it came to the House. and. Uh, uh, these were the, the $51 million cut in capers, Oh yeah. Uh, the million dollars or so, that, I think it was 700000 in what we call K-Track, which is, allows pharmacists and doctors to be able to go to a, a, a website <coughs> and, and see what prescriptions the patient has already to keep patients from uh, uh, doctor shop shopping. Doctor for, shopping. Yeah. Uh, and you know, the country itself is in an opioid addiction problem and I, it hasn't hit Kansas as bad as in some states and this was kind of preventive medicine so to speak to be able to have this uh, funded uh, and and working to to ensure that pharmacists and doctors can access that they also uh, it cut as you 
as Rick mentioned, some educational funding for uh, technical schools, which we like. We like to have people go to technical schools. Uh, and uh, so we, we took all those in bundle and we passed it. Uh, in fact, we had uh, six uh, Democrats that voted for it. Uh, and, and I think the main reason was because cutting the $51 million. I think Rick told me on the way over here, one of the senators had mentioned, it's like borrowing money to put in your checking account. Oh. And that's what the governor yeah. wanted to do, to keep a higher balance in her checking account. So yeah. that's where we're at. Well, all right, we're gonna cut away, take a break. We'll be right back. You're watching Legislative Updates. <clears throat> Welcome back to Legislative Updates. I'm your host, Doug Thompson, with John Barker. And if you're watching this course on television, uh, John Barker's on your left, and in the middle is uh, Senator Rick Wilborn from uh, McPherson. And Rick, you've been in the Senate for how many years now? Uh, going on uh, my sixth year. Uh -huh. Sixth years. Well, uh, you know, I always appreciate it when when um, uh, people are so dedicated to come in and serve either in the House or the Senate for a number of years because, uh, boy, it's a learning curve that, that goes with it. It just takes a while to be able to be a, a good, effective leader within your district. and. Uh, that's why I appreciate you doing that. And I know you head up uh, the judiciary, is that correct? That's correct, yes. Okay. I've been uh, chair of the judiciary. This is my third year as chair. Uh, and of course, uh, Chairman Barker had been chair of the House Judiciary. And occasionally I consult with him on advice on different things to kind of get the lay of the land. And he's been very helpful. Yeah, John, John was district judge uh, uh, for 25 years here in uh, our district. He's kind of got the hang of it, doesn't yeah, he? Does. Yeah, he has, he has the hang <laughs> of it. He's done it, done it a while. You bet. So tell yeah. me about what's going on with the Senate. Well, the uh, Senate, of course, a little bit uh, unlike the House, uh, since I'm chair of the Judiciary Committee, the Tuesday before Sine Die, we had a special judiciary hearing uh, to, uh, uh, to vet and to later confirm uh, an appeals court judge nominee that the governor uh, had uh, nominated to replace the failed nominee that was uh, voted down uh, at uh, two a couple weeks before at uh, veto session. And, uh, and the Supreme Court had made a finding that that there had to be a vote on that candidate. There had to be correct? a vote to finalize. Mm -hmm. It turns out uh, their opinion and the AG's opinion is that the uh, language was pretty vague and we'll have to fix that language going forward probably. Okay. But we did have the honor of having that, uh, out, what I consider a very good hearing for this uh, appellate court uh, nominee and she was outstanding and she passed out of the committee favorably 11 to zero and then it passed on the Senate floor uh, with only one dissenting vote, and as I said, it was a protest vote because she wasn't from the western part of the state. Mm -hmm. But in addition to that, we uh, in the Senate would be a little different. We, uh, through, by special rule, pulled up Senate Concurrent Resolution 1610, which is a resolution that we'll be discussing going forward next year that uh, mimics and mirrors the federal way in which we appoint and vet judges unlike the present way which we do now, which is pretty much appointed by the executive branch uh, with no input from the legislative process. The process would go forward more similar to what we did with the appellate judge that I just talked about. And of course, uh, it, it took two thirds vote to pull it above the line and uh, out of the Senate uh, Judiciary Committee. So starting next January, we'll be able to debate that new federal process. Yeah, without going through committee because of your special rule. But and we can do that in the House also. And if you pass it out, it will then come to the House. Right. But you know, the Court of Appeals, we do have legislative oversight. The governor nominates, the Senate confirms. That's right. Uh, much like the federal system. But because the a Court of Appeals was created by the legislature, the Supreme Court, of course, was created by the Constitution, and we would need a constitutional amendment to change that process. Presently, the, uh, the KBA, the Kansas Bar Association, interviews and makes recommendations to the governor, and then the governor appoints that name, uh, and it goes, that's it. Okay. Thank Please. you, John, okay. for going a little more detail there. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I kind of shortchanged you on that. Well, John, you at, uh, I know you were, um, again at Topeka just recently and you got some things done uh, not only for uh, the Eisenhower Center but I think you had a couple other things you're working on. Yeah we're well, working on a couple of things of course sports books is uh, constantly going on until next year but uh, yeah this morning uh, I was able to get up and drive into Topeka I had at the be my behest the governor has uh, proclaimed June 1 through June 6th uh, commemorative for uh, D-Day the Eisenhower 
foundation folks were up, the, uh, Eisenhower, uh, Don Hamlet with the uh, executive director of the uh, museum was up. We had a signing ceremony. Uh, the governor was, uh, was very, uh, very kind to us. Uh, of course, in this week coming, uh, we've got a number of uh, uh, things happening in a, at the Eisenhower, of course, June 6th, uh, D-Day itself. They have, I think, 70 or 80. 70 or 5th. Yeah, 75th anniversary, but they've got 70 or 80 World War II veterans yeah. that are returning. I talked to a friend of mine who was here at the 50th, and he was in charge of security. He said at that time we had 400. Uh -huh. 25 years later, we can get 70 or 80. Yeah. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, I encourage anyone, to, uh, <coughs> everyone to come down and, and visit with those veterans. They're going to be available to talk to people, and several of them are making uh, speeches. And so I, I, it, it's, you know, it's, it's so Abilene to be friendly and bring all those folks in and, and let them, uh, and especially young people, learn the history of World War II. Oh, yeah. Yeah, many, many of the, and I'm not just picking on the younger ones, right. but many of the people don't know uh, which countries were on which side. Yeah, and they're going to have delegations from Britain, France, and uh, I think Germany. Oh. Uh, uh, so, you know, they'll have some uh, military... Attaches is what we call them yeah. that will be there and, and they'll be probably make presentations. So I, I'm looking forward to it. Well, I appreciate you doing that, John, because that uh, Eisenhower Center is just an amazing facility and, and, uh, and it's just awesome to see uh, the history there and, and uh, what Ike did and his, the family homes there. It's just right. an amazing place. And I know they're going through a, a renovation process now. And it will open in August. There's gonna be a soft opening, I understand, in July. Uh, just to see how it works, but uh, I mean, they've spent several million dollars in the renovation, and I think, uh, you know, it, it's like going to a new library, and I'm looking forward to going and visiting. And we've only got a little bit before we cut away and take a break, but when we're, when we're cutting away to break and we come back, I want to talk to you about some of the disappointments that you have from uh, what took place in this session, what was passed that maybe you didn't feel should have, and what wasn't passed that you would have liked to have seen passed. Right. And I'm sure that that's all part of it, otherwise why? Well, of course, Rick, on the last day, they had a number of demonstrators they had to shut down oh, for I a period that. of time. So, yeah. so Rick was, a, was there firsthand. He had firsthand <laughs> knowledge. That's right, and John, I failed to mention that. It uh, yeah. was quite disruptive to the Senate body. And yeah. the Senate president shut her down, then recessed, and then later cleaned the floor and everybody. Oh, I, I understand. I went up one time to watch John work, and I coughed two or three times, and they were really looking at me. <laughs> so I wasn't sure I was going to get escorted out of there. <laughs> uh -oh. We're going to cut away, take a break. You're watching Legislative Updates. Welcome back to Legislative Updates. I'm your host with uh, John Barker and with uh, Rick Wilborn from um, the 35th district. That's correct. Out mm -hmm. of uh, McPherson and and other territories there. Matter of fact, your your um, district and John's district butt up to each other in a couple of spots. Don't we they? actually overlap a overlap yeah, overlap right. a little right. bit. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Rick's got the southern part of Dickinson County and all of Marion County, and I've got part of Marion County and all of Dickinson County. Okay. And uh, so we've done several events together, and we enjoy each other's company. And, and uh, and we do try to get along most of the time. Well, yeah, we we try hard. <laughs> we try. <laughs> we try well, hard. Well, Rick, we're glad that you're here. You know, I was reading in the paper about a demonstration that took place up there, and it was uh, involving when the Senate proceedings were going on. That's correct. Uh, you remember earlier in our conversation, uh, Chairman Barker talked about the debate on uh, House bills. Uh, substitute bill for 25, which is the one that was overriding the governor's veto on those four different points bundled. That was the very bill that we were debating. And uh, then uh, the protesters uh, were actually out in the hall going into the chamber, uh, which is uh, not unusual uh, by special interest groups. Then all of a sudden they infiltrated the uh, balcony. And then they started getting vocal and singing choruses and we shall overcome and you know all this kind of music and terribly disruptive to the Senate body where you couldn't even uh, conduct business. Right. And the Senate uh, president, of course, recessed. And then it still didn't stop. And so then she made the determination that we'll just uh, clear the floor of uh, media, uh, all the members and everybody, so that the Highway Patrol could then escort them out. And it's my understanding that they did arrest uh, seven and charged one in particular uh, with uh, disorderly conduct, and only time will tell how that works out. 
but uh, their main focus was Medicaid expansion and or the lack thereof and uh, obviously they either were trying to make a scene or they surely knew that there's nothing we could do that day on that particular issue. And, and I understand the, uh, the one person that got up wanted to be handcuffed. Yeah, she, exactly. She, 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 wanted, she wanted to be photographed being handcuffed. Yeah. And yeah. I think the Senate President acted properly, especially when they threw some banners over the balcony, which could have hit a member. Oh, yeah. yeah. And yeah. she worried about the members being injured. And so. then you don't know if things are going to escalate. Exactly. In there. I know there's metal detectors going in, but you know things can get thrown over, like you said, right. and it can kind of get out of hand. Well, what else going on in the in the Senate? Well, I think uh, again, uh, Judge Barker will say the same thing. One of the major disappointments, of course, was not passing the decoupling bill right. from the federal uh, Trump's uh, tax cuts, which in in effect uh, creates a tax increase to we uh, Kansas citizens, because we will not be able to take certain deductions unless you have $24,000 combined deduction for a couple on the federal, you'll not be able to take any deductions at the uh, yeah. local level. Well, we passed that in the Senate, uh, and I think it passed in the House. House. It did. But the governor vetoed that, and we, we did override the veto in the Senate. The House did not. And the House was not. Uh, we had 79 votes, uh, and we needed 84. Uh, the, the problem with that is the the, the, the the Kansans who are paying taxes are the ones it affects. And uh, an average family uh, of three or four uh, that, that make about sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 a year will pay about $500 to $700 more a year because of this. Because they can't It was an unintended consequences. Most other states decoupled, but Kansas we did. We, we voted, the legislature voted, the governor chose to keep that money uh, into the state coffers instead of returning it back to the rightful owners, which are the Kansas taxpayers. And we are, I understand, one of seven states that have not decoupled. Right, right. But the number of states have decoupled. Yeah. Uh, and it just uh, lets you go back to what you did last year. Okay. Uh, so, uh, w initially we had a, a retroactive piece to it to make, to make it go back to, to January, but we took that out at the, at the request of the governor. Yeah. So we thought she was going to sign it. But unfortunately she didn't, so she'll get the additional funds. Uh, so uh, hopefully she'll propose to spend them or, or next year, and I think this bill will come back next year. Uh, there's no reason the state uh, you know, is making more money or taking in more money than it had did last year. And I, I just uh, think that it's just an undue burden on the taxpayer to pay an additional five to six hundred dollars a year. Well, no, one, of, one of the things that you wanted to do was uh, be able to pay on the uh, capers, pay right. money into that. Was that like 51 million? 51 million. She had vetoed it. We overrode that veto. So now it will be paid. Because that was going to cost, I, I think I mentioned it the last year, about $10,000 a day. A day. In interest. In yeah. interest. So uh, we will not be paying the interest. We'll actually make the payment. And hopefully that will uh, decrease the unfunded actuarial that we have. Okay. okay. Since so. my short term in the Senate and in the legislature, we have made great strides, right. thanks to our group and before us, in shoring up capers, moving from 59% okay. actuarially funded. Second to worst in the nation. nation to almost 70 now. Mm. And for this governor to have the gall to delay that payment uh, was just astounding to me. Right. And I think the motive there was to keep those funds available so that she'd be above the 7.5% statutory requirement thereby, I, Representative Barker mentioned this, then you wouldn't have to comply with the pay-go. Plus, you have more money to spend and it looks better going forward, but uh, what a price to pay. Yeah, I can, I can see where it would be, and, and, uh, and I, I guess I've seen at different times since John's been doing the show, since we've been doing legislative update, people will ask, especially if their retirement is the CAPERS fund, they'll say, is there going to be CAPERS money available when I retire? And uh, that's of concern, of course. And so when you're down to the um, second worst in the nation, and then you and, start and, back and, the and other direction, up, it goes up. You know, we're uphill. We're not the second worst. We're not even close to that now. Yeah, yeah. We went from like 53% funded up to where 67, 68, close to 70. Yeah. And if we get into the 70, 75 range, we're, most actuaries will tell you that's fully funded. 
Excellent. So, so we're moving in the right direction. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, we're in a cutaway, take a break. You're watching legislative updates. Welcome back to the final segment of legislative updates. As always, um, my host is John Barker, and in the middle in between us is Rick Wilborn from uh, McPherson, 35th District, and he's in the Senate. I appreciate you being here, Rick. Thank you Thank so you much. Thank you for the invitation. And Thank John, it's been, a, it's been a great year. This will be our last show for the, this season yeah. until the legislature kicks in again, or if John gets called back into special session, then he'll update us and uh, bring us information. Uh, and. And, uh, and that is so helpful. And John, we appreciate it that yeah. every Friday after you get done with working at the legislature and it's been a long week for you each time and you come back in and uh, take the time to yeah. educate and bring you well, up to help. speed. It's been helpful for me because I, I see a lot of people on the street and they stop and tell me, say, we watch your show. Thank you for that yeah. because we didn't know exactly what was happening. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Thanks for watching. See you next time on Legislative Update.